So uh, moving on from Doreen's uh, amazing and motivational tours and all, um, I'd like to introduce to the stage Nick Van Breda, who's the County General Manager of the Campus Party, intriguing, uh, again in the Netherlands. Um, he's going to be talking uh, somewhat um, speculatively about time and space travel in the era of digital twins uh, and whatever digital twins is. I'm sure he will explain it to you. Thank you, uh, Nick Van Breda. You probably think, what is this guy bringing all the way from the Netherlands? <laughs> I had six suitcases. <laughs> no, I had three suitcases. And um, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of um, things that I uh, had to bring because I want to give you all an experience. And it's very hard to do that in a two-dimensional screen. So I would uh, definitely ask someone of you in the audience to try out a virtual reality experience today. So if there are any volunteers, um, please raise your hand. I uh, have two headsets with me, so two would be perfect. You would try it out, sir. Anyone else? Second person? There you go. All right. So let me start with my presentation. As VR doesn't come out of some, uh, something, um, VR for me came out of um, a crisis, a personal one. I was an event organizer in the Netherlands, and I was not able to organize any physical events anymore. So for me, organizing innovation festivals like Campus Party with over 10,000 people flying in um, was out of a sudden not possible anymore. That came to the question, um, I came to the question, um, what if we could travel through space and time without the burden of travel today? Because if you look at travel today, let's see if it goes forward. We look at travel today, um, we see that actually in March, when we had a lockdown globally, over 89% of all carbon emissions due to travel was gone. So we had clear skies out of a sudden, rivers were out of a sudden more beautiful, we were starting to hear the birds again. Like, what, when was the last time we heard the birds in cities? We saw animals entering, entering cities, <laughs> that, something we, we never saw before. And um, that, that was actually a beautiful thing. Um, so what we saw is that it's a significant decline in pollution due to lower amount of travel. And I wonder if you all close your eyes and think about a future where we do not longer have to congest anything. How would that future look like? Because today's travel is always congesting. And how can we travel in a more healthier way? So please close your eyes and think about this future for yourself, where you can travel through space and time. So open your eyes again. Must have been a beautiful dream, as we all have beautiful dreams, but pursuing those dreams is mostly a hard thing, right? So um, 50 years ago, real estate developers started drawing in 3D. And that drawing in 3D, just 10 to 15 years ago, this turned into actually digitizing all buildings, all assets that we have outside. So what happened is that we actually got a virtual twin of a building. We have it also online, and then we build it in person. And this way of doing that is um, really impacting a lot already. Um, for example, children are able to build in 3D, then project it in the real world with augmented reality, and then afterwards, the people that are creating the buildings are getting a 2D copy and, and I have to understand how to build this thing. Well, we, can, we already have a 3D model of it. So it's a little bit odd. And nowadays we have a lot of data, a lot of sensors in every building and all over the world. There are smart sensors measuring our weather conditions, our CO2 footprint, uh, lots of things we can measure. Um, but the problem is that visualizing this 
is only for the happy few data scientists out there. We don't understand that data. So what if we could visualize text and numbers into pictures and videos, actually 3D simulations of what that really is? So something like this, that you can really have it in your hand. You can see an overview effect of the city you are living in. And that's the world that we are going towards. That's the world if, that when every asset is digital twinned, but also all digital processes, all processes that we have in factories um, and in uh, moving from uh, A to B. And this is uh, uh, a 3D printed part of the Notre Dame. It's 3D printed with concrete. This is what is possible when we don't have the skills anymore to do this by hand. Now we just have a 3D scan of the building of Notre Dame and we can print out the exactly beautiful uh, devils on the Notre Dame and, and recover it after disaster. This is what, um, what we have done in the last few months. Um, we have been able to digital twin municipality halls, wedding halls, event spaces, the real physical space, but now in a virtual reality environment. So every one of you can actually um, go in there, meet each other, have a wedding digitally, uh, live stream DJs in that virtual reality event. Um, and, that's, and that's like just a starting point because this scanning takes a week, then we have the whole thing in VR, um, but then we have this technology thing um, like this. This is a co work space we just uh, delivered for a company in the Netherlands that does no physical meetings anymore because of the lockdown regulations. They have a really hard time to actually stay alive. And they, they are looking at the hybrid model where they can have like 10 people in the physical space and they can add up to 10,000 people in the virtual VR environment. And they will see the others that are there in person. They will see them as well. And the others will see who is there in the virtual world. So you can actually still make a connection together and you can still have that social uh, experience that you really admire in an event like this. Um, and this is next level because when we add physics, nature laws, and we are creating educational grounds for water management that we are doing right now with the University of Advanced Applied Sciences, we can actually mimic and simulate our future. So we can no, we don't no, we no longer have to need books from the past. We can real time create books of the future, simulation of where our future is going to, looking at all the data that we already have. We just have to visualize and bring it together, embed it into one thing. And this is now um, going to be developed in the upcoming six months for students to work in this environment, 50 students at the same time. Real time changing of weather conditions what will happen to the atmosphere? Will there be a flood in Bangkok, for example, or in the Netherlands? And how can we prevent that? So having a 3D model is actually not, not a strange idea. It's actually helping to save our humanity from uh, nature disasters. And now we are getting at the point where it's getting really interesting, because this is me as a virtual twin. I was able to scan myself and turn me into an avatar. And I was able to wear a very simple suit with 40 sensors to have a representation of myself, my full self. I can have give yoga classes to the world around me. They can stand in my body in the virtual reality world and they can mimic my movements. So you can learn how to play cricket in a very fast time. You can learn how to do ballet. We can learn how to dance even in our homes. So that's um, the way I started looking at these technologies and started developing them because my business was done. My physical events were gone. So I had to come up with some creative solutions for that. And this, this is my first TED talk, the first TED talk ever given in virtual reality. And the great thing is that um, there's no privacy concerns because everyone is an avatar. So filming the crowd is not a problem, um, but also the uh, camera angles. We were able to put 100,000 different camera angles in there. So we can create the beaut most beautiful environment for every, everyone's speech uh, that we wish for. And then, yeah, you see that within a, a few years, we are all able to move around in this new virtual world where we are seeing, okay, 
we just build a dam, we build, just build a delta, how is that actually working out? Yeah, here's an example of how we do that in the Netherlands, yeah, because we are five meters under water level in most parts of the Netherlands, and one third is uh, under sea level, we now have to uh, think uh, ahead. We really have to think ahead. So again, um, we are traveling for that what we miss or seek to explore. And the exploration part is very easily solved with virtual reality because any context, there's so much digital twins already out there that we can already use Google Maps Street View with a simple app called Wonder, and we could travel back in time to our houses where we lived 20 years ago. We can just travel with a click, and we're there, we can walk around in that space. We can actually come up, uh, like have the history re lift um, in front of us. And that's um, um, how I, I see that we are now able to bring back history classes into a more interesting way, and we are able to actually give students the, 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 the enablers to build a future, to simulate a future that they wish for. And that's, um, yeah, it's always to do with what kind of role do you want to have today. I want to be in construction, do I want to be in education, do I want to perform on a live event? And this uh, was last year's, um, this was last year's Tomorrowland. Over 400,000 people go there every year, it's a great festival. And this was this year's event. It was virtually, and it was even more beautiful. <laughs> And that's really how far the game industry now is. There were over 2 million people attending the virtual one. They even made more profits organizing the virtual edition than the physical edition. Over 40 million of profits um, in a digital first edition. So that's about next level performing and having the opportunity to have all your senses involved in an experience. And that's where I'm experimenting again. So I'm wearing this crazy glows where I can feel like I feel in the real world. I feel objects and the, and the force of objects. So I can feel how heavy things are. And that's giving these senses that we have in the real world, giving that space in the virtual world. So we can definitely um, do some more things with that, like um, controlling a robotic arm like this, just using your brain waves. We can control a robot arm. We can do a surgery from all over the world at the comfort of our, of our homes. We are actually now training surgeons in VR to be, become the best surgeons in the world in a safe environment. So that's, the, uh, that's a lot of things are already happening in, a, in an individual perspective, in an individual learning environment. And what I think is really interested if we are going to create a world where we can do and use this in a multiplayer environment. So my focus has uh, been in the last six months is to create multiplayer uh, cross-platform environments that every one of you can access with your phone, laptop, or a VR headset. Because accessibility is key here to give everyone the opportunity to participate. So not, not only the rich people can actually uh, use this technology. And then we can have the feeling of flying a plane instead of sitting in the back. And that's much more exciting, right? <laughs> so that's, um, that's one of the things. But the most promising thing is actually that we are able to close the skills gap. We are able to train people four times faster in a virtual reality environment than in a classroom setting. Four times faster. Um, and what happens is that people with no skills zero knowledge, we're able to get to the medium skills level in no time. So getting from a high level of expertise to a better level, it's all learning by doing what we are doing here, but giving people all the tools and all the technology like expensive medical labs at the fingertips um, gives them the access to medical schools that are normally waiting lists, uh, waiting lists to enter. And now we can have this virtual reality classroom and we do not longer need a waiting list. We can give the expensive laboratories to everyone. And that means that labster.com is a platform now that has over 3 million students using these labs every day. In the last two years, from 150 schools using VR for education, now over 1,000 are using VR classrooms to fastly skill train people. So that's all about one goal, uh, preventing us and our surroundings from getting sick. And that's the current situation that we're in. Um, but the opportunities, of course, are much more than that. 
So what kind of suit would you wear if you have the opportunity to be anywhere, eh, any place and any time that you want to be in? And, and that's why I introduced this new learning model. Um, this new learning model is actually uh, an outdated model that I added some extra elements to because learning through reading a book and then only able uh, to, to understand 10% of the book or remember 10% 10 10 of the book um, is a little bit still what we are doing in classrooms today. And I would love to see that we are all leapfrogging education towards the 90% or the 100% that we have a digital twin everywhere of the situations that we should be teached in. Uh, like if we are talking about nature, we should stand in nature. And if it's not possible to get away the classroom, we make it possible. Uh, we add the sensors, we add smell of the plants into the headsets. Uh, we add extra elements, extra senses in the hardware so we can have an environment where we can learn very high level, high tech skills in a very safe and, 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 and fun environment. And this, this is what is changing now, from an individual learning environment to a multiplayer learning environment. And that is changing a lot of things. Uh, imagine if we have the best delta system in the world and there's countries out there that have a, have a problem with floods. Maybe you really have it over here. If we can tune in the expert anytime, from any place, anywhere, without having to take into consideration the, the long travels, we are able to actually bring knowledge to people in need much faster. And that's, um, that's something like this. So all the research is backed by PwC. They were able to train people in emotional intelligence and social skills up to four times faster in a simulated environment, in a multiplayer simulated environment. And people were more focused because we, they couldn't get detract, distracted. They were all in there. They were fully immersed into the environment. And that means that classroom that we know today doesn't have to be that way anymore. Because we are four times faster training skills and we are able to put people into the right context, seeing what happens if you cut down a tree, what happens with wild animals. You see it in front of your eyes and you get a sense of purpose. And having this sense of purpose in education is I think the most important thing we should focus on. That people are understanding their purpose in life on a much earlier way by discovery, it's experimentation. You don't know it from the start, but now we are focusing people on training skills that they no longer see the relevance for. But if you put them in the context and then say you need a math, you need to understand math to, to solve this problem over here, like a real life quest, I think people will do much more uh, of their best. They bring much more dedication into learning if they see what they can solve. They see the relevance of their learnings. And that's all about creating more accessibility. Because the PC or the phone environment of VR is not immersive. It's two and a half D. It's like a screen like this. But then you see people moving, like you're walking the, uh, around in a game. But if you're in there and you can move like you do, like you do here, and you're moving in that world, it's called six dimensional freedom, your brain will think it's real. Even though young kids understand it's not real, if we use this uh, for the age of 50 plus, we will see some funny things. Uh, they will just walk into a wall, no problem, <laughs> because they really feel they are there. Uh, you can help people with stage fear, you can help people with uh, afraid of height by giving them a VR environment. We, uh, we use this for therapy all the time. It's actually a, a common good now in the Netherlands to have VR therapy for people from the army, for PTSS, treating PTSD. So now it's, we are able to tr uh, help people with traumas to come overcome them by living the environment again. And for me, I lived together with refugees for two years. This is what I really needed two years ago. When I lived in a refugee camp with 400 people, I was not able to empathize. I was not compassionate enough. I was not understanding what they were feeling when they had to flee. Um, so I had a lot of pre-assumptions. Um, but if I had the opportunity to tune in into a refugee camp in Syria, I was much faster able to understand the situation and act and even help them from a distance. So not ha letting them go all over the oceans 
to find a safe place we could help them remotely. And I think that's one of the key things that um, uh, this technology can be used for. And that's um, um, now happening in my life in a lot of environments. And that I can connect people all over the world together. Um, and I've helped over 50,000 people on board in this virtual reality environment. Um, and where they can enjoy a live artist from all over the world. Where they can co-work together twice as productive because there's speech recognition and putting post-its on the wall. All of these things are getting into place. And, and I see that um, once you're in there, if you do it once, you already know um, that you want to do it again. So the excitement when you are living your dream, like it feels like that, is so high that almost everyone that I gave a demo to actually purchased a headset. And even though I am all about sharing technology, they, are, they, are, they want to have this uh, right at their homes to do VR sports. Like I do table tennis, for real, but now also do it in VR. Or well, they can play against the top players in the world. I never was able to do. I can play against Olympic players in VR. I'm not able to do that in the, in the real world. I'm not that good but they are in the VR world now too, because they were also in lockdown and they had no place to train. So they could do it at home with VR. Um, so it's used for a lot of things, for doing boxing, uh, dancing, uh, lots of different sports, uh, cricket. I'm, tomorrow I'm downloading a, game, a cricket game in VR by a Karachi person who developed this. So I'm really excited to have cricket on my VR headsets from tomorrow onwards and it's free to download. So this person is really giving back to society, uh, creating virtual reality worlds that is going to be used by maybe millions of people if they understand how to get access to the technology. So that's, that's my closing remarks. I really would love to see and invite you all to this virtual reality world. And I would love to see you there as a digital twin because every one of you is able to get in there and if you looked at my presentation, there were some links hidden or maybe not hidden. You already were able to get in VR because I, I spread some links. I will just get back to uh, one of them um, where you can actually uh, head with your phone or with your laptop into the environment. Let's get there. Oh, it's far away. Um, have you seen the link? There is one, for example. This is, um, Let me check. Yeah. this is my TED talk giving in VR. So if you want to check it out, it's going to be published globally in the TEDx um, in the coming days. So it's a preview, it's a first edition. The fun thing is we, I could redo it, <laughs> so I could make it better and better. Um, but also, and some other links in uh, here, these links on top, um, there are different um, realities. So one is uh, actually uh, going into that co-work space and creating, uh, brainstorming over there, uh, talking together. You can even turn your webcam on so you can still have uh, a face next to an avatar. And this one, um, there's a link on top. And this is, um, uh, I've done a lot of research about uh, VR. This is also a research folder where you can check out different best practices using this. So. With this, I want to end, and I would love to give the persons that just raised their hand a demo. I don't know if the time allows me, because I will do it backstage. <laughs> I will do it backstage. But thank you all for listening, and if there's any questions, just uh, hit me up on socials, and uh, I would love to answer all of those questions and uh, create VR environments for your uh, situation, if that's, if that's something you want.